Awesome. Hi, um, everyone. Welcome to the Global Ballet um, Teachers Community um, and to the Backstage at the Ballet series. We're so thrilled to have you either here live or watching um, the recording. Um, my name is Cecilia Elisiu, and I am the Director of Global Ballet Teachers, as well as a soloist dancer with the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, Global Ballet Teachers' aim is to create free community-led courses, classes, and resources to educate and empower our ballet teachers around the world. And we are doing just that with this series. Um, here we chat about live, um, or yeah, we chat live um, about ballet productions um, and everything behind them. So today we are thrilled to have Rob here to talk about costuming, um, which is something we haven't chatted about here. Um, and we also have additional resources on Google Classrooms where um, Leora puts together a collage of video clips for each production we're talking about. So you can actually go and see the movements, um, video clips that either I or I find online um, of choreography from the production that you can teach your students um, and then additional documents as well. Um, and so in this chat, we will be discussing the ballet production that uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet just put on stage called All Tharp, um, which is featuring the works of female choreographer Twyla Tharp. She's an American superstar in the world. So it was really fun to be able to do three of her productions. Um, we will talk about this later. Um, typically, we have a video release of the production that PNB performed on stage. It's a little bit unclear whether that's going to be happening or not. So stay tuned. I will send it via email, but you'll definitely get all of these resources, um, whether or not the live recording happens or not. Um, and before I pass it on to Leora and Rob to start the conversation, um, I just want to let you know for those joining us live, this conversation is for you to ask questions and to get curious and yeah, get all those nagging, nagging things going. So I will stop yammering away, pass it on to Leora and then Rob. Hello, uh, I'm Leora. Um, I've been here before. <laughs> um, I do ballet appreciation programs uh, for children at this point in time here in Toronto, Canada. Rob. <laughs> oh, hello. I'm a costumer at uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet and worked on this current production of All Tharp. And uh, welcome. Anything? <laughs> no, okay, so I'll, I'll, I away. guess that's, that's my cue. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so before I start sharing my screen, um, we, we've all kind of been on the edge of our seats, uh, not quite knowing what's going to happen in terms of performances, live performances way out there in Seattle, and the subsequent recordings that have been accessible uh, through Global Ballet Teachers. Um, but we have chosen to brave through and we will talk about the entire production and we do hope that you will at some point in the present or future have the opportunity to watch these works because they really are very interesting. Um, so I will share my screen now and bring on a few visuals. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Do we have sharing? Do you see my uh, desktop? Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent, good. Um, there was that one time that I went on and have you shared your screen? We don't see anything. <laughs> okay, here we are back on track. So Al Tharp, um, three works by Twyla Tharp. So as has been our custom, we will be providing kind of a, a handout, a cheat sheet um, available through um, Google Classrooms. Normally what I do is I rely heavily on what Pacific Northwest Ballet offers on their website, but I also go kind of wild a little bit and, oh, we should link to this and we should link to that. So um, it would be great. I mean, sure, I would appreciate, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we all uh, clicked on everything and went here and went there and, and, and kind of went on this incredible journey of curiosity, but I know it doesn't work like that for everybody. So that's what I can offer. Do with it what you will. So the three works being presented in this program, all by Twyla Tharp, are Brief Fling. I'm just going to scroll down. Whoops. Huh. Hello. Where'd you go? Do you still see the document? 
No. No way. No. Okay. Here we go. Let's do this. No problem. So we have brief fling, followed by sweet fields, and finishing off with waiting at the station. And it is my understanding that the best chances that we have for watching one of these works in its entirety is waiting at the station um, with music by Alan Toussaint. I, I don't know how to, am I pronouncing that yeah. right? No, T Toussaint? Toussaint, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Jump in there whenever you feel it's necessary. Um, a more theatrical production. Now we are in the, in, this, in the world of theater. We're using dance for the most part. We do not use words. We also use music, we use mm -hmm. stage, um, scenery, props, costumes, which we will talk about as well. Um, but even within all of that, there are particular kind of um, subgenres or s some um, norms and conventions that have developed. So we would associate, for example, a work like Waiting at the Station. Oh, wow, that's just like a Broadway musical, but that's a whole genre in and of itself. And there will be you know, crossovers or nods or kind of acknowledgements between genres and art forms, and it's all over the place. So um, if you feel inclined to follow that little lead and go and delve into the world of Broadway musicals, amazing. On the stage, what we will, what you will see, I hope, is a, a, a little story. Uh, it's a, it's one work of three works being presented in a, in the in an evening of works. So, it wouldn't be the same as a narrative work that spans the entire duration of the performance with one or two intermissions in between. So, in terms of the craft of storytelling, you have to find different solutions for how to compact this story into a shorter period of time. Of course, you will have um, roles that may or may not have specific names and may or may not be characters that are also known um, in other works of art that are outside of that balletic work. So for example, it was a revelation to me to learn about um, the three fates um, that are represented within this work uh, by three dancers in gilded and in, in gold colored costumes that Rob may address later, um, but in fact do um, relate to um, a concept, an idea from um, ancient Romo, Gre Greco Roman <laughs> mythology. So, another reference that you can follow up on or not. Um, because I'm known to speak perhaps more than desired or necessary, I will move right along to the next piece. So I'm moving backwards to the middle piece now. And if you noticed, as I was scrolling, we have the first work, oh gee, great, really colorful, cool costumes. Second work, hmm, photos in black and white. I wonder what the color of the costumes are. They're also white. And then colorful again. And as I was looking for pictures online in order to incorporate in this handout, um, I came across a series of black and white photos from this second work um, in the evening, Sweet Fields. And I wondered, because nor like I'm of the age of color photography and I feel really like somebody's um, uh, cheating me out of something by giving me only black and white. And I apologize, this is not very kind of high brow experience here. I want the color. Um, and black and white is sometimes a little bit too artistic for me. However, having seen a few uh, color photos of this work, I got it. No, no, I understand now why the medium, the choice, the deliberate choice on the part of the photographer of developing these pictures in black and white is so suited to the particular work, which in itself is danced to a cappella singing with no, so a cappella means only vocal, no musical accompaniment. And even that, lends towards a very stark, minimalist, clean um, presentation of the work. So not only the costumes, the, the color palette of the costumes, the lighting, the, the scenery, the stage design or lack thereof, um, the photography 
the dance steps. It, it, it's very interesting. I had never um, come across anything of this nature, um, particularly the set of, um, of songs. I'm calling them songs very loosely because they are sung, but they are in fact, for the most part, um, hymns. So religious devotional um, singing. Um, these were also new to me, so I went down the rabbit hole of uh, Googling around and finding the texts, um, because they can be a little bit hard to decipher um, if you're only basing yourself on the singing. So in the handout for that section, you will also have links to the texts wherever I was able to find them. Um, the one which was hardest to hunt down was uh, virgins clothed in a clean white garment but I'm on standby. I wrote out to anybody and everybody who I can find, find in the, found that I could find in the Shaker community in the United States, where can I find the lyrics to this? So if I get anything, I'll add it on. And if not, we will just have to live in wonder. Um, now back to the beginning, <laughs> having started at the end with a ballet named Brief Fling that referenced in more way than one, whether intentionally or unintentionally, Scottish, Scottishness and Scotland. Um, and the extent to which we, this was done um, might vary in terms of the costumes, the dance steps, the music, and any other component that fed into the work. And this is where, <laughs> Finally, <laughs> I will be passing it over to Rob. I have one little thing, one little extra thing there. So brief fling. In the notes, you will see that, oh, um, a fling, a highland fling is a dance known within traditional dances of Scotland. A brief fling, huh, does that mean a one night stand kind of a thing? So that may be another reference. Um, the costume to the lay person, who is not versed in the intricacies of traditional um, Scottish costume of the different of the highlands and the lowlands and the, and the inland and the, and the shoreline, et cetera, et cetera, in different eras um, and interpretations might have to Google and come across a lot of information. So the segue into passing it on to Rob to talk about costumes in Briefling and perhaps elsewhere within the works presented in this program, so I'm just gonna very, very briefly go over to a few Scottish inspirations in visual Scottish inspirations. So if I were to Google and to look up, so what do, what do the simple folk do? That's a reference from a, a musical, but what is traditional Scottish um, costume? So, you know, this is what I would come across. This is what Google would, would would give me. So I see men in skirts, in plaid pattern skirts, um, and more plaid. This would be a wedding, a uh, wedding picture. So I know that in many cultures, your wedding pictures is the occasion where you might get dressed up in traditional clothing. And where else might you find traditional clothing? So at least in Scotland, you could find it in the Highland Games. And if we have any preconceived about ideas about men in skirts, then I wanted to make sure that we all acknowledge that um, Scottish men um, do very manly stuff. So the fact that they're dressed in skirts, and that's just my sense of humor, please don't take me too seriously. And I definitely don't mean any offense to anyone's culture and traditions. Um, so that was one. And then that would get me thinking to, huh, Scotland. So yeah, sure, we've come across Scottish, Scot the theme of Scotland in ballet too. We know how to do that. So we know how to do that in a ballet called La Soufide, for example, where we have James, the protagonist, asleep in his chair in a Scottish country home, wearing a kilt, a skirt with plaid patterns. We know how to do that, even if the clan that he represents, the colors of his kilt are a different color. And of course, all the other uh, clansmen and clanswomen um, within the story, which brings us to, okay, so are they trying to be accurately, culturally accurate Scottish? 
Potentially not in the 19th century. But what about 20th century works also inspired in some way by Scotland? So this would be the following sequence would be out of uh, Scotch Symphony by George Balanchine. Um, so again, I see something in the head gear. I see the sash with the um, plaid and the skirts and the socks and the shoes potentially, I don't know. So the last Scottish reference that I thought to explore was, okay, so what about the dancing? So is the ref are the references and the nods and the acknowledgements and the richness of briefling, do they also relate to how people in Scotland dance, whether now or in the past and the traditional dances? So broadly speaking, there are at least, and, and this is just a very cursory survey of what's out there in terms of what to do the simple, how do people dance in Scotland? So there we have one category, which is um, Scottish country dances. And we have another category, which is Scottish Highland dancers, dances. And they, they may have different emphases and we may recognize within Twyla Tharp's work, perhaps some uh, quotes or references. So once again, the men dancing in their traditional kilts and other um, accessories, um, one form of dance, the country dances, and the other form, the Highland dances. And this is where I felt obliged um, to check this out with someone who I know who also is trained in Highland dancing as well as, as, as other dance styles, including ballet. Um, this is Georgina Barr of New Zealand, a dance health consultant and registered podiatrist. Um, and she was more than happy to lend her eye to watching the work and seeing, hmm, this looks familiar, this not, this. I, I feel that, that the jury is still out, but I will give to you a few poses from Scottish Highland dancing. And then Cecilia, maybe you will also jump in there with any references that you were uh, told perhaps by the repetiteur, the stager in the studio. So the, un, the untrained eye perhaps might feel that, huh, but they're doing ballet, aren't they? Aren't they? And then the trained eye will say, oh, no, 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 but that doesn't qualify with us, the ballet people, versus Highland dancer who may be watching ballet and say, well, that's similar, but not quite. We do it a little bit differently. Um, there are rules and positions uh, for, for hands and feet and arms and stance. And there's, <laughs> I found this interesting that the position of the fingers is related to the structure, anatomical structure of the antlers of the reindeer. Um, and all of this was quite enough to send me into a, a whirlwind of, oh my goodness, Scottish, I gotta know more. Um, yeah, so I think, I think this is the, the fastest I've ever spoken. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this was for, for the better and not the worse. Um, I've stopped sharing. I will pass it on and thank you all in advance. <laughs> um, so I guess I have a question for you, Rob, now that we've had like a little bit of a download of all three of the pieces. Um, do you have a favorite and why? And what was your role? I guess let's start there. What was my role in this production? No, uh, that'll be the next question. I tend to have like 10 questions at once. Okay. So let's just start with favorite costume um, in the production. Um, I, uh, my preference was Sweet Fields, the simple. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, all of these, uh, we're in an era now where we sort of are, I think we're in transition also about how we view costuming. Um, it's up till now, it's always been very gendered in the costumes. And uh, so, and we find that in all three of these pieces. And Sweetfields was an, quite an early piece for Twyla, I think, quite a ways back there. And Norma Kamali, who designed the costumes, um, beautifully done. I just, I like the simplicity of that piece very much. Uh, the accompaniment, the choir, gorgeous songs and the shakers themselves are such an uh unique community 
Um, they believe that sex is a sin, so there is not procreation. So the only way they keep existing is to get more converts to join that crowd. So there's this ver there's a purity to it and industriousness. That's what they're known for. So uh, I like the purity of those white costumes. You know, personally, if it were being done now, I would like them to be ungendered. So everyone just wears the same thing because the Shakers also believed that men and women are equal. They have equal contribution, equal power. So I think had it been done present day, probably those costumes would all be the same to also you know, sort of emphasize that part of uh, the Shaker philosophy. Um, I think uh, waiting at the station, you know, very theatrical, as you said, Leora, and uh, you know, really interesting costumes, very fun to watch. Uh, the three fates we call the Golden Girls, uh, <laughs> lovely, and and uh, Cece, of course, one of the loveliest, uh, but uh, and just very fun, and it helps that narrative quite a bit to have that uh, variety of costuming. Um, I think, personally, I think the least successful is the brief fling. Uh, I find the costumes, even though they're colorful and, and they're all on their own, nice costumes, they're, they're a bit too specific for me um, because I don't think the piece is that specifically about Highland dance. There's very little of it. <laughs> and the music also, very little Scottish, you know, sort of even, uh, passing reference to it, it gets quite contemporary in a lot of it. And so the the costumes to me are sort of a distraction from what's happening. It feels a bit, uh, I don't know, schizophrenic sort of when you're watching it. Um, also because of uh, Isaac Mizrahi designed those costumes and uh, we have found in the costume shop when we're having to work with um, fashion designers, uh, not a, they don't always really understand how the dance works, what dancers need to move, you know, that sort of thing. So it can be sort of problematic. And you can see it in, in many of his designs where like the, the men, one of the men has to wear a shrug like this. Was that new shrug. this year? It's always been in there, but uh, apparently uh, it doesn't always get worn. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really, it's pretty problematic. It's very hot. It has nothing to do with Scottish history or dress. There's like and, a little uh, Scottish emblem on the shoulder or something yeah. I saw that looked like a patch. And I was like, it's I know the PNB wardrobe did the laundry. It's not <laughs> by mistake, <laughs> well, it's actually, but it looks it's like It's actually it. Argyle going down the sleeve. Yeah but it's, it doesn't make sense and it's hard for the dancer to wear. And, uh, and as you saw the pictures that were posted of traditional uh, garb, the men are not you know, in shrugs or bare chested. They're almost, they always have shirts on unless even in the, you know, when the guy's tossing the caber out there, he has, he's clothed also. So this thing of the shirtless thing and, and I don't know, there's, it's just too much. Like they have the sporin on the kilt as well. The sporin is a, with a little bag, like instead of pockets, they would have this. And, but they're, they're quite elaborate. They're usually made out of fur and they're detailed. And to have that on a, somebody who's wearing shorts and the sporin is, is, doesn't make any sense because that's always with dress that they would do that. And so that sort of thing to me was a little odd. You know, but uh, yeah, I guess the costuming wise, I thought the most successful uh, Sweet Fields and Waiting at the Station, those work very well. Yeah, I have so many questions, um, but I guess the first, since you brought up um, the possibility of changing, or if it was done now, maybe we would change the costumes, let's just say for Sweet Fields, it could be for any of them, but Sweet Fields, since that's what you brought up. Maybe talk um, us through the process of a, a, a piece is created, costumes are created for it. Can you change them? How would you change them? Is that normal? Kind of what are the rights or rules behind a production like this by Twilish Tharp, who is a well-known choreographer who has a repertoire? Like what is the process of maybe changing it or is it set in stone forever and ever? Uh, well, pretty much set in stone forever and ever. Um, you know, so you see, say, uh, gosh, 
uh, Balanchine's early work, you know, Karinska designing costumes, those they still wear those same costumes and they do get remade because costumes fall apart and all that, but yeah. they're remade exactly like that, that those original drawings. Whoever the designer is, you know, they submit the, the drawings to us and a draper will make a pattern of that drawing and which is, you know, an amazing skill to have to be a draper because you're looking at basically a one dimensional image and yeah. you make that three dimensional. And lots of times you're only seeing say a one quarter pose and you have to figure out what all the rest of those sides look like and how that's going to work. So it's, it's an amazing talent. And then once the draper has made the pattern it gets passed off to what we call the first hand who, or a cutter who will cut cut that out of the material and then a first hand who will sew it all together. And then we have fittings throughout to make sure it fits and alterations and a final fitting and then it goes on stage. But yeah, those costumes remain the same and it can be quite frustrating, you yeah. know, in a costume shop to see things that, you know, uh, they're, they're quite dated and many very sexist, and, uh, you know, uh, which is something we, we're now dealing with but for so long it, it was never dealt with you know so uh, it's interesting. So I guess um, this leads me to Twyla Tharp is still alive sure. like what like what's the the barrier or maybe she has been asked to change certain co certain costumes for things or we're being specific to costumes since you're here and that's kind of the the basis sure. of this co uh, conversation but it could also be choreography like this lift really doesn't work or whatever um has anyone thought to like call her up and be like hey could we make this <laughs> non-gender or this shawl isn't working could we get rid of it like is that an option because she's alive obviously we know like George Balanchine has passed so no one can just call him up but um well we do have with the, I'm with the like with Balanchine's work the Balanchine Trust yeah and everything has to go through them and some costumes do get changed if they approve it we can change a costume. We just did our production of the Nutcracker and there's been some controversy over some of the characters within that, that they aren't, uh, they're sort of anti-culture a bit, you know, they offend people. So we redesigned, we proposed a redesign for one of the characters for the Chinese tea. And now we have a cricket instead. And that had to go through the Balanchine Trust to okay that design change. And they're very particular. And um, I think also not specifically artists or creators involved, they're more administrators. So it, it can be quite frustrating to get a design process going with them to get it approved and all that. But so it does happen. Now with Twyla, um, if you if you know of Twyla Tharp at all, you know that she's incredibly controlling of every aspect of her productions, every aspect of, of posters, of promotion, everything involved. So and and I don't have a lot of personal experience with her, but from listening to others, um, it's very difficult to approach her about changing anything mm. because she assumes whatever she's done is perfect and there is no better version of it. <laughs> so, uh, so I would doubt that she is, would be willing to change many things. Um, that's unfortunate because I think she has some really amazing pieces that would benefit from some slight adjustment you know, especially like I said, Sweetfields, it's really a beautiful, unique piece. And it would be so much more representative of that culture if it were if it were done this way, as it was more unisex, because that's really what they believe in. So yeah, but yeah, yeah. not she's not a big one for change. I love that. I have so many more questions, but um Leora, do you have Oh no, I was just oh yes, nutcracker, nutcracker, but Rob already touched on that because we just had that experience of also, what was new to me at the time leading up to the Nutcracker chat that we had was that I did not realize that there was this freedom with costuming and Nutcracker and Balanchine's Nutcracker as performed in different ballet companies might have and indeed did have different costume designers. That was the first time I had ever 
come across that. I didn't realize that for Balanchine. I thought that indeed they would all be the original costuming and the production of New York City Ballet is the, what I should expect to see on stage also with PNB. But I was uh, surprised, pleasantly surprised, you know, just learn something new. The other thing that just occurred to me once you've given me the opportunity to speak, you know, how can I not take advantage of it? Um, so the, the, what, the relationship between costuming and the dance. So I, I perpetually revert back to 19th century ballet. And in that mode, um, the movement language, the, choreogra the choreography itself tends to be more neutral so that if you were to watch someone rehearsing in a practice tutu without the music to give away what it was and if you did not know you did not recognize the sequence um, they would be easily interchangeable so let's say the variation from um, La Bayadere and a variation from Le Corcel um, there's nothing particularly Indian or um, Greek Turkish about one or the other. And if it weren't for the little additions that you had to the standard tutu to make one more reminiscent of a sari and one more reminiscent of whatever traditional dress one was inspired by, they would be the same. So I think, Cecilia, when we were talking, we were also talking about, okay, so in the ballet studio context, when I have to make choices about costuming. I don't always have the privilege of having somebody design something for the dance, then trying to match up something appropriate that would be a good, that would kind of work together, the costumes and the dance, the movement language that was selected for the piece. Well, I think that, you know, with, with the costuming, when I was talking about briefling and it's so specific in its referencing that I, in general, I think you're much better off not being so specific because as you said, the actual movement is not indicative of that culture. It's ballet language, you know, so it, it doesn't have anything to do with it. So to just hint at something, I think is more, you are more successful that way than to be very specific about it. And, and the whole thing of changing, you know, cultural appropriation, which is great that we're talking about it. You could go through so many ballets now and so many of them need to be changed or, I, I, but I don't, actually that's not my opinion that they need to be changed. I think they are artifacts and they're interesting to see. So I have, I start to get a little, uh, apprehensive about this constant changing things because somebody says, oh, that's offensive to me. That's, a, you know, but, but they are cultural artifacts in a way that we can learn from and we can acknowledge before that performance happens, say, we understand that these things are not all culturally appropriate, but this is a, you know, this is an artifact. It's like going to a museum and looking at paintings. Many of those paintings can be can be very offensive to many different cultures. And yet do we, you know, we don't want to erase them, you know, because we're learning and that's how you learn is to go through all this process. And you don't want to just, you know, dismiss something. But in future productions, then you take all that into account and, you know, it's uh, more inclusive, and which is great. Yeah, Rob, I, I have a lot of those same feelings and I have constant conversations with my mom because she loves going to the opera. She's like, oh, I just the old productions have just been like completely shoved away. And now we're moving to the more traditional. She's like, but I wanted to see like the old Madame Butterfly, like the way that it was and not just like this completely stark one um, costuming. And it's mostly costuming and scenery that are changed, that just changed everything. Um, the yeah. And yeah, anyway, we can, that's another topic, but I wanted to open it up to um, the teachers that are here live on the call. If you have any questions about costuming or the production or anything that we've talked about, I just want to give you a, an opening to, to hop in there if you want um, and just go ahead and unmute if you have any questions, if not, we'll, we'll power on. Okay, I'll take that as a, we are listening. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and um, I'll ask them for you. Um, but Rob, you were talking about the process of how we go from 
um, a drawing that you got from the designer to creating it. What is your process? What is your, your in in that process? And how did you get into costuming? Wow, so I, um, I'm fairly new to it, actually. Um, a good friend of mine, Mark Sapone, who I'm sure Cece knows. Love um, it. Amazing, amazing designer, draper extraordinaire. Um, I needed work and he gave me a job and I said it was actually during our build of the Nutcracker. And um, I started really just like folding fabric and making sure pattern pieces were all together, like right at the bottom, because I hadn't really sewn before. And um, I had made pillowcases, you know, so I could do a straight line. That was it. Um, but it was the monumental production. There was so much work to be done that I was given more and more. And uh, as uh, Mark and Larray, who was our uh, the manager of the costume shop, saw that I could do it, I just kept getting more to do. And eventually, Larray came to me and said, "You're going to do the Spanish." which I <laughs> was a huge, huge thing. And so, yeah, I learned on the job, basically. I learned how to make, you know, bodices and the whole boning, the, all that stuff, all the language too that I didn't understand was, it was kind of overwhelming, you know, it was trial by fire, but it was great. It was great to be involved in that. And over time, I've gotten much better and I'm more confident now. And I'm not a draper, however, like I said, that's a very specific talent. and. It, very few people can actually do it very well. It's really hard to take that drawing and make it into something beautiful and wearable. And uh, Mr. Zappone, who I mentioned, is really a genius at this. He can take, and, and he's, he's a designer's best friend because many designers, as I said, don't really understand how that body has to move on stage and Mark can make that design into a very beautiful costume. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, a lot of people involved in costuming are, I mean, you think of it as this creative endeavor, which it is, but the, the technical side is really the side that um, is, I don't wanna say more important, but equally important. You're a technician making everything fit together perfectly so it doesn't fall apart, you know, all these sort of things. So there tends to be a, like a group of technicians more than the creative side mm -hmm. who um, get that costume on stage. You know, uh, you don't, it's not really a creative endeavor when you're uh, sewing a costume because you're you're it's like math basically you know you have to make that equation work out right or you know your seams are off it fits doesn't fit right you know it doesn't move so um the creative side is more from the draper and the designer the rest of it is you know getting it done exactly as they want it and the, the draper's role really is to produce a costume that is exactly like that designer's drawing and their idea. So there's some, you know, you have to be a good communicator too with the designer to, is, the, is this what you want? Do you want this to turn more? Do you want more, you know, whatever it is, yeah. more jewels, you know, it's a uh, so good dialogue there. And uh, like I said, quite an amazing talent to be a terrific draper. Yeah, I love that you've talked so much about the design of the costumes and the creation of it. So now that we're getting in the nitty gritty, like, let's talk about the fabrics that are required for dance. Like you were talking about fashion de designers come in and they don't really know what we need for dance. So I guess what is the difference between a fashion designer creating something for the runway versus a fashion designer who's good at creating things for dance um, or movement? Like, how do you see that juxtaposition? Hmm. Well, you can, if you, if you watch fashion at all or see fashion shows, many times the garments that are being worn on the runway are very hard to move in. <laughs> you know, the models look quite afraid many times when they're in their clothes. So, and they're, you know, they're very, very tight many times. There are a lot of things that are, that look beautiful um, sort of on statuary, but, or a clothes hanger, but when you're actually having to move, especially the way dancers move, um, that's a very different scenario. And I'm going back also, 
um, to 19th century dance and moving through it. And I think uh, today's dance is so much more athletic than it ever was in the past. And I think part of that, um, certainly training and you know being fit and all plays a part but we also now have materials that move and we didn't before we didn't have anything that stretched before everything was solid and boned and was very hard to move in and hot you know like even tights you think back in the day those were those were not fun to wear so now we have all this lightweight you know four-way stretch material that allows dancers to really be able to do anything you know and uh so that, that's terrific. It's very hard to sew on, but it's terrific to have. <laughs> yeah, because I think there's an element of like the, the movability of it, but also the breathability. As yeah. you said, like dance is becoming so much more athletic. Like you can't have like a big coat on. And I know in waiting at the station, there are more pedestrian clothes, mm -hmm. um, especially for the men. They're wearing, I don't know what the material is, but like cotton, thick linen, like, jackets on top of long sleeve shirts and um mm -hmm. one of the dancers james moore who does the main role he's just like non-stop running around dancing the whole time and the jacket is soaked so literally wet and you can wring out the sweat after the production so like i don't know whether you you would change that to something a little bit lighter or how you would make that different but um i think having such breathable costumes makes the dancer feel more comfortable as well because you're not like weighed down by this like wet fabric oh and in the fittings always you know if there's a jacket involved the dancers are like why why <laughs> you know and we have that with many designers they insist on jackets and i can't tell you how many times we have made jackets for dances and they don't get used because when they finally get out there moving around, everyone realizes this doesn't work and they may wear it, you know, for 30 seconds at the beginning and they take it off and throw it down and then they go about their dance. So you're always there. That's always a fight with the designer. We're like, you know, we've done this many times. The jackets don't work, but I want them, you know, so <laughs> like, okay, we'll do it. But, you know, so it's, it's, yeah. So there's a problem with that. Also now designers now, uh, I think dance in general now, everyone's sort of obsessed with streetwear. Yes. And every choreographer, all, most all the young ones are like, I just want streetwear. You know, that's really all they look at. And I don't know if that's kind of a, an outcome of Instagram or, you know, selfies or whatever. There, it's just so much about, well, I just want it to be normal clothes, normal, normal, which for me is, we're in the theater. This is a theater. There's actually a proscenium here. You're painting a picture for people and you, I go to the theater to, you know, to transcend. I, I want to be out of myself and see something, a different world. And when I just look at street clothes all the time, I'm, I'm really bored by it. Really mm -hmm. bored. Do you May I? <laughs> I? I love this because I, I, I would like to also offer the perspective of um, the idea of artifice as a developed, you know, as dance, um, theatrical dance, stage dance in European culture developed. And that is still the tradition that we are feeding off of. Um, and it, and a lot of it had to do with not, it, not um, repeating what you see in daily life but in fact, portraying ideas and characters that were almost in stark opposition to daily life. So the movement language also developed with that in mind. And now with whatever the reasons may be of wanting to bring in daily life onto the stage, and yet the movement language is not that of daily life. So a jacket works where a certain type of movement perhaps does not involve the upper body a lot. And yet the movement language, because it draws on multiple cultural influences by this point in time, all engages the upper body so much in a way that a jacket doesn't work with it because a jacket is the result of whatever developments ha might have happened in a culture that does not need that freedom of movement in the upper body. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting that, I don't know, the things conceptually may 
be of one world in the costuming world, but then in the move, but then the movement world is drawing from other inspirations, and maybe that's why they don't really work together sometimes. It's like I have this thing about um, rolling on the floor in tutus. Doesn't work for me. Yeah, I'm just with doesn't. The <laughs> um, or in gown, you know, we had a piece where they were in like gowns, you know, sophisticated gowns, and people are rolling on the floor. I'm like, well, no one would ever do that in a gown, ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't know what the idea is here, but it doesn't really make sense. But this whole, the it's the non-costuming that I find, uh, you know, we, we, do a, we do a program at PMB called Next Step, which is, mm -hmm. uh, company members uh, choreograph on our professional division students. And the costuming, they also do their own costuming, which I find problematic as well, because you're already asked to be, you're already doing something that's very complicated, choreography. Yeah. To be a good choreographer, you know, it's a real gift to have that. So then to then also have to design a set and design costumes. And, you know, this is a collaborative medium. That's why we have set designers and composers and costumers. So I'm, I, I really uh, encourage choreographers to seek out costumers and uh, set designers and collaborate because it'll only make your project better. It's, and the same, all of these pieces add to um, the picture that the audience is looking at. So to want just, well, I'll go back to Sweet Fields. Those are very simple, very simple costumes, yet they're very theatrical. Mm -hmm. they're, it's, it's a real, it's a great idea that this work adds a great element to this piece. And uh, I think Twyla Tharp's early pieces, especially, you were talking about movement. Her early pieces were much more about it was almost pedestrian movement made into dance, mm -hmm. you know, instead of ballet movement. And so I thought that she was quite fascinating in her earlier works, the way people just walked. And she would overemphasize shoulders and the way hands worked and that, but it was very much coming out of everyday movement. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that costuming reflected that, but it was always heightened, which was great. Whereas now we get more just really strictly off the rack clothes. Pants off the rack, shirts off the rack, jackets off the rack, you know, so you really are looking at exactly what the person sitting next to you in the audience is wearing, mm -hmm. which to me is what's what a waste of time and money because you have this opportunity. Yeah. And, and also seeing the whole stage is also a huge gift that uh, I think uh, younger choreographers, but not just young, old ones too, don't take in the whole stage. We have a resident choreographer, um, Ceruto, right now, who is, I think, a genius at that. He really looks at the entire picture up there. You can look anywhere in, from the audience, you can look anywhere on that stage, and it's interesting. The lighting, the set, the costumes, you know, the whole thing. He really has this great idea of theater, a the whole, scene, how everything works. So. Yeah. Um, we have a question from one of the teachers, um, Gwendolyn, um, multi-step question, but um, is every step of the creative costuming process um, archived with fabric samples um, and are Pantone colors useful in reference to that? So yes to that, Rob. <laughs> yes, um, we have for every piece we do, there's, we call it the Bible. And that is the sketch, um, the all of the fabrics, every fabric we've used in there, there's that fabric sample that includes braiding and you know any little buttons, everything that goes in that is in that and documented. When we got it, where we got it, how much did we get, you know, how much does it take per costume? All of that is written down. So you can recreate it down the line when they start to fall apart and you have to do it. So that's, yeah, it's a really important part of the process to keep that in mind, especially if you're doing, um, you know, uh, previously produced works because that's how you know how that stuff is supposed to look. Now that said, a lot of those things you get 
you know, as you go along it, into modernity, a lot of that fabric isn't available anymore. Yeah. So you're having to recreate things that look at having to, we had to actually for a brief fling, we had to um, make material because Isaac Mizrahi had custom made materials for his stuff. So then we had to go and find somebody who could print onto our fabric, you know, the patterns that he had chosen. So you have to do that. And, um, what was the second part? The Pantone color yeah. as like references. We don't do it all the time, but it is useful when you're uh, communicating across, you know, the internet because you can't tell on your screen mm. what color that actually is. But since Pantone is universal, you can say, is it this? Yes, it's, it's that red. No, it's not that red, it's this red because <laughs> there's such a variety, you know, in the colors. So it does help a lot. Yeah. Um, we'll wrap up here. Um, so Leora, maybe come up with one more question to close off. But I think one to me that's really um, pertinent to this community, especially is like, if you were, if you're a teacher or a studio owner, and you have a production coming up, kind of where do you, st where, what would be your suggestions in starting costuming? So we know the opinions of like, streetwear versus like a costume or like something that's a little bit more theatrical but like what would your advice be with all of the background and experience that you have with productions that have come through Pacific Northwest Ballet where would you start um yeah picking costumes and sourcing them or creating them if you're dealing with a designer like kind of where where what would your advice be for that um Honestly, simplicity is is always better, you know, especially if you if you don't have a big budget, you know, you can be very creative um, and still be quite simple. Um, like I said, I think uh, now, especially looking at your dancers and your choreography, um, the ungendered uh, costuming you know, is is a way to go. I, I think it works really well. I mean, it depends, of course, on what, what story you're telling. I also think a great resource for many um, is our design schools, because mm -hmm. there are all these students who are designers and they need to have work too. And they're, you know, they're so hungry and they work really hard for no money and <laughs> because they'll have this credit. They can see this costume that they've done. Many of them sew themselves. So you could, you know, I would seek out that resource. It's a, it's a really good way to go, you know, to give somebody a step up, just like you want to give your dancers a step up into the world. Do that for everybody. Like I said, it's a collaborative medium. So seek out new voices and give them all a chance. I love that. Um, what is your take on costuming with like just a leotard and tights? Like how would you, if that's what you had, how would you up that ante for a, a performance? Well, there are, you know, really so many simple ways to change what that, that look is. You mm. can, you certainly dyeing is always great. Paint it, you know, you can paint on that fabric. You can, uh, you, you can do so many things that way. Applique, a, a single piece of fabric added to a tutu and tights in some creative way can change it completely. Mm. You know, so, and you know, don't be afraid, cut it up, cut some holes in there, do, you know, really think about it though. Think about how you want to want it to look, what you want it to represent, but it doesn't have to just be that and that, you know, it can be, you can be quite imaginative with a very simple palette, so. I love that. And as, as Leora mentioned, and we talked about with Sweet Fields, like it's literally everyone is in all white. They're in like little kind of short shorts, a crop top bra thing with like a really lovely jacket. And that's like pedestrian. You could probably go buy that at a store, but having the pieces put together in a cohesive like color tone, I think is yeah. what makes it more theatrical than just like let's wear some jeans and like a crop top and put dance to it <laughs> um leora oh um if the question is to rob and i'm sorry to put you on the stop but on the spot but i i feel that you're very creative <laughs> so um versatility of costumes so 
you, if you're starting out with the leotard and tights mm -hmm. and you have to make some kind of a minimal change for one dance, but there's another one just after it. Um, so you have to use basically the same blank board um, for multiple dances. Um, so any ideas about something that can be removed, put back on or used again instead of on top, on the bottom or sure, what, sure. what else could one do in order to accommodate different needs with the same costume? Right. Um, well, you can always put them on in different ways as well. You know, a lot Ooh. of times, you know, you can wear a shirt. Traditionally, you can turn it around and wear it backwards. It looks completely different. <laughs> and that's a very simple way to change that look. Um, making basic, a basic shape that somebody can slip on and slip off, like an A-line, you know, top mm -hmm. dress that can be masculine, feminine, to is an easy you know switch put that over a the top tunic of type of thing a tunic yeah so really transform it and it's very very simple to make it's really cost effective um you know something around the neck a tie or a, just tied around the waist a hat oh you know long gloves completely change the look of, of tights and leos just mm -hmm. by putting on long glo colored gloves we um did a piece with chris wielden where Oh, yeah. had these amazing orange gloves and man it, it it transformed the costume just by doing that so there are a lot of very simple ways to go about it they don't have to be elaborate yeah i think that's a really interesting example we're actually doing it next season right the curious kingdom so we'll we'll be able to dig into that next year but that's an interesting one leora where it's like you have a base how do you add to it because I believe that the main costume for that one is like a silver unitard, men and women. And then you add the gloves, you add a shawly thing, you add a dress on top of the unitard. And it's within the piece, within the 20 minute piece, the same dancers wear multiple costumes, but it, the same base is there. So um, I'm really glad you you brought that up with because that just rung, rung bells of like within one production, you can wear the same costumes and have multiple costumes with different fast add-ons um yeah well we could keep going and going and going for sure this is like such a fascinating topic and i know our teachers are getting so much out of this um but yeah rob any like closing words on costuming um that you'd like to share or that you've learned through your your years well I, honestly i would just say don't be afraid of experimenting you know, we have traditional dance. We know what that is. You know, push the envelope. Do something very different. Don't do the everyday ordinary. You know, and like I said, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be very simple, but find inspiration outside of dance as well. Look at, you know, paintings, look at photography, look at sculpture, look at the environment, go out into nature, you know, find inspiration outside of just your medium. Because like I said, the more thoughts and voices involved, the more creative it's going to be. And it'll be more universal for your audience too, who sees it. So don't be afraid, push the envelope. Don't put, a, don't put jeans on the stage. <laughs> They're Death awful the paper dance. jeans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rob, thank you so, so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom and um, all your thoughts behind costuming. Um, this was really, I learned so much. So thank you. Um, and Leora, do you have anything to close us off? Oh, um, only that this also marks the end of PNB's season, 2021, 2022. Uh, you know, Hard to believe that we've come full circle, although I wasn't there for the first rep. Um, but nevertheless, for uh, global ballet teachers, this is a, an important moment as well. Yeah, um, and just a super quick, I'm gonna share my screen. screen. Um, all of the additional resources are on our Google Classrooms here. So as you see, the all Tharp is 
um, going to be published soon after this uh, conversation, but we have all of our past resources. So Swan Lake, um, you can watch, um, not sure what's happening, but watch different productions um, and videos, um, and then all the PDFs that Lior put together. So plot points, Romeo and Juliet. So just dig in here. The link will be um, uh, sent to you via email and WhatsApp. So hop on in there and get videos and you can watch the pieces that we've talked about with the plaid and the sweet fields with the simple costumes and the golden girls and a golden shower cap, which is fun. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for joining us on this series, Leora for putting it together, every single production um, and Rob for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope you've all gained something from this conversation and take it on and and be empowered by what Rob said, like create, create your vision um, and don't be afraid to experiment because you can always do it again. Um, so thank you so much. Happy June. And we'll see you at the next one. Cheers. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.